and welcome to this Creative Pathfinders event. I would like to begin by thanking some of my colleagues for their support of this webinar series. A special thank you to Clara Davison and her team in the Office of Advancement in the College of Arts and Sciences for facilitating these webinar events. I'd also like to thank Alison Kaboski at the Barnett Center for her kind spirit and generosity as she works with me behind the scenes to facilitate this webinar series. Creative Pathfinders was envisioned as a way to strengthen our connection with our alumni network in the arts and design as we celebrate the unique contributions of our alumni within their respective fields. And perhaps now more than ever to remember why we need the arts. I wanted to make a space through Creative Pathfinders where we could turn towards each other and take some time to marvel at the courageous and singular career paths of each of the alumni that will join us in this series. As I introduce our panelists this afternoon, you will find their short bios in the chat box within your Zoom window. Alumnus Kamasi J. Barnett received his MFA from the Department of Art at The Ohio State University and lives and works in Baltimore, Maryland. Kumasi's work, works have been exhibited widely both in the United States and abroad, including a recent solo exhibition at Lowell Ryan Projects in Los Angeles. He is currently teaching at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago as well. And Kumasi will be joined in conversation this afternoon by Courtney Hunt, art and design librarian and an assistant professor in our fine arts library at OSU and Caitlin McGurk, Associate Curator and Assistant Professor at The Ohio State University, Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. There will be time towards the end of the hour for questions from our audience. So we really encourage your questions. Please submit them within the Q&A function as they arise. I'm truly looking forward to this conversation and I can't tell you. So I'll hand it over to Kumasi now as he gives us a brief overview of his creative work in the world. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Allison. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the work, how it came about, and also about myself and my journey from uh, Maryland and Baltimore to Ohio State. Uh, so give me just one second, let's get you started. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. So my work is a series of comics from my own collection, altered and changed as little as possible to create new narratives. Um, these are individual stories uh, that turn fantasies into reality, that shape new vistas in, in truth. So you'll see things like the amazing Spider-Man changed to the amazing black man, uh, racist comics, um, policeman, thug, Superman, Batman, altered to have these new meanings. And how it began is I actually, in 2015, uh, Freddie Gray died in the back of a police fan on his way to being detained. And I am from Baltimore and where this happened is about five minutes away from uh, where my father lives. And I was living in Brooklyn at the time and I felt so disconnected from what was happening in my home, in the place that I live, in the place that I care for more than any other place in the world. And I couldn't express what I was feeling and what I thought in the manner of the work that I was making. So. I looked for a way that I could express it that wasn't in abstraction, something more concrete. Uh, and I found it in my closet, in boxes and boxes upon comic books, uh, things that were valuable to me. And it was a struggle at first because I was destroying a thing I loved to create something brand new, but it was also something that was really um, cathartic because I found a part of my youth and my nostalgia, memory, history, happiness, and comic books are how I learned how to read. So they're a really integral part to my life. So as I said, I'm from Baltimore. 
Uh, I'm from Turner Station, which is a small community uh, in Dundalk, surrounded by a larger community. And Turner Station is essentially all black. Uh, and it is surrounded by a, another community all to service um, Bethlehem Steel when it was still open. Uh, I went to the University of Maryland for undergrad. And then I went to the Ohio State University for grad school. And that's where I got my MFA with a specialization in painting and drawing. The, the paintings I make started in early 2015 for myself, purely a way for me to get out a personal feeling. And then in the middle of 2015, I had this show. And this show was in um, Brooklyn at Sulphur Bath Studios. A friend of mine, Mike, was doing it. And I brought these with me. This is the first time they were ever installed anywhere. And I couldn't help but bring them at the same time I was bringing my abstraction, which I've been showing consistently. And I was just like, uh, maybe I'll just get these out of the studio. Uh, maybe I'll just take these somewhere so someone, I just wanna get a little feedback on them. And it was a fight between this and the abstraction that I did. And I put it up on the wall and that was it. That was the start. These are among the first ones ever done. As I said, I take comics and I alter as little as possible to make them true, to reveal actual stories. Some are instantaneous, like some happen, I see it and I know exactly what I wanna do with it. And some take longer. Some I sit with the ideas, some I sit with the comics. I've owned so many that they will pop to mind when it, I have an idea. But they're these parables. I come from a tradition of oral stories, uh, passed down through generations, told from parent to child. Uh, important information is passed on verbally, not written. But I don't really speak in that way. I'm a painter. What I know is painting. Uh, the way that I speak is through color, intensity, contrast, light, tint, shadow. And that's the way I get concepts across and ideas across and important information. If I was a writer, I would speak with verse or stanza or short stories. It's a different way of telling story. It's like a, I like to think of it like a gospel singer, like a singer who loves God, not someone who loves God who sings. So I took these parables and then I took pop culture, my culture, like the comics are part of that culture. And I mixed them together to reveal something true. It reveal something and start conversations about real things, things that I think are important. And like, uh, there's a lot of things that people need to be made aware of or they don't want to be aware of. They don't want to pay attention to. Um, it's like a dinner party where people say, don't talk about politics, religion, sex, or money. Well, then don't invite me because that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about real things. I want to talk about important things. So these are things that matter. They are created with the tropes of what America is, the tropes of America, the common, the everyday experience for Americans, what's known and understood, often overlooked, but like buried by those who don't want things to change or don't want to deal with the repercussions of change. I think about them as revealing truth and revealing um, honesty, what is going on for prosperity. Um, putting down truth concretely in a way that I can talk about them so they can't be ignored as myth later, so they can't be shunned off to the side. The saddest part, I would say, is that all of these stories are contextual to America at any point in American history. So any of these stories can be told uh, from today to the first days of American history as it's counted as an 
people landed on the shores. And we as Americans know these stories so well, but we're so fond of moving on from them. We're so fond of uh, not addressing the issues and trying to have the forgiveness without actually having unity. We want unity without coming to the table and giving anything up. So something, it's important for me because attacking these ideas, revealing these ideas and painting these ideas is something I was avoiding before in my art. And it's an interesting journey for me from uh, Maryland to Ohio to this work after getting my MFA. And it's a series of steps coming to this point because I was doing something very different in like 20 years ago. Like I was doing abstraction. Uh, this is a series of circles I was making before I went to undergrad um, on velvet with oil paint, gestural. And then like I did a series of palette paintings, taking the palettes of people who uh, were painting and painting classes, the disposable palettes and composing paintings with those. And that eventually led to these brushstroke paintings. And these are like individual brushstrokes painted on acetate, then cut out and used to compose paintings on the wall. So they're semi-permanent, sometimes permanent. Uh, and when I started making these, there was really something there. Like it's about painting. It's like in, it's an investigation in the painting. Like what makes a painting a painting? What's the least that you need to make a painting a painting? The act and material and the full, wait. Sorry, I get sidetracked with this because it's so much about art history. And that was one of the things I did at the University of Maryland was art history as well as studio art. Like it's important for me because I decided on art. I was working full time before I went back to undergrad and I was making good money, uh, money that would be good money today. But someone said to me, you only have to do this for 20 years. After 20 years, it'll be easy. You just retire. And I thought about working in a job that I couldn't stand for 20 years and the investment of time. And it basically sent me on a whole other path. So when I went to undergrad, I knew I wanted to go to grad school. I knew I wanted an MFA. I didn't know if that was gonna happen immediately or it was gonna take time. But when I was on to these paintings, I had something and I started looking at grad schools. And when I did, you know, I did what people do. I looked at the top 10 grad programs, like the list of the top 10. If you go to the rankings, the US News and World Report or whatever it is, and you, you look at the reputation and that's which basically where you start. And I had this conversation with uh, Lincoln Mudd who was a professor at Maryland at the time, at also Montgomery College. And we had a conversation about the language of grad programs. Uh, what type of artists are in the programs? What is the fit? Like, who is there? And he actually mentioned Ohio State because he went to VSU and they have, there's this relationship between the art programs where VSU students come to OSU, OSU students go to VSU and there's this like back, back and forth, this history of exchange. And that turned my opinion around like what I was looking for. So I started breaking down programs. Like I started looking at, at different programs different ideas of what um, what I wanted from a school and what I wanted besides just reputation, like the language of the school, the types of artists who come from the school, the people who teach there, the faculty, the alumni, the attitude. And because I was a McNair scholar, I actually had the chance to come out to Ohio State during the summer. And when I came out, I, that's when I met Fioris West. Now that's my guy. Like, I just wanted to learn from him. He's an artist, artist, like a painter's painter. And when I met him, uh, it really kind of changed like what I was looking for in a school. So I applied to a, a bunch of MFA programs. I got into like four or five and I had to choose. 
and when I mean a bunch, I mean a bunch. Um, and I got into OSU pretty early and I got into another couple of schools and I had scheduled a visit at one of the art schools that I got into. It was like a top five program. And I, so I went there to visit. And when I went to visit, uh, the person who showed me around was among the most miserable people I had ever met at a school. They were on the edge. And I don't mean angry, I mean sad. And I wondered why they chose this person. Is this the best representative for this university, for this experience? Why would you bring that person out? Um, and then I immediately went to Ohio State afterwards and it was the polar opposite. Um, I met Fioris again, loved him. Uh, that was my guy. I met another potential MFA student. Uh, we're still huge friends now. He's one of my closest friends. We had pizza with the first and second year MFAs. Uh, we hung out all that night, had a party. It was um, an awesome experience. And they, they were very complimentary and very happy in the program, but they never said it was easy. Like it was still hard, but it was important. Just to see people having that um, interaction with the program. So when I came back and I had to make that decision, you would think it's easy, but it's not because that reputation is huge. It's enticing. And like, there was a three to $4,000 scholarship and you could be a TA if you wanted to be, but you had to find a professor to essentially ask them to be your TA. So you had to track them down and kind of wrangle yourself in there. And now you're telling me, looking at it, it's 50 to $60,000 a year or 100% paid for. And I'm like, hmm, that's still a decision. Unless you use a full ride fellowship the first year, teaching the second year. And I still have this, this feeling that it needs, like it's a hard decision. And I had this conversation with, with Pat Craig, who's at Maryland, uh, one of the professors there. And he said, good artists will be good artists no matter where they go to school. And that's the moment where I chose it, OSU. And I'm so glad I did. Because looking at my work now, Fioris told me then, when, when I was doing this abstraction, there was something else in the studio, something that I wasn't even asking him about. And he told me like, I think this is more of what you are or who you are as an artist, as a person. When we talk, when we interact, this is the version of you that I'm interacting with. And he could see it in my studio in the work I did then. And we talked about it. We talked about telling stories from my perspective and how much of it was our perspective, how it was a voice that was shared, how it rhymed, how it harmonized with each other and how much I was avoiding it. And he said I could avoid it if I wanted to, but I should think about it. And then I didn't because I didn't want to because it made me uncomfortable because it was too raw. It was too personal. It might be my real interest, but I still struggle with this work today because it's so much of being on display. It's, it's like being too open and I like to hide behind a few layers. But I think there is something here in telling real stories, understood stories, but from a certain perspective, which is mine. And the something that's here is there's a conversation here. There's a question here. There's a problem here. And for me, it's about finding problems, finding questions and initiating that conversation. And that's what I'm interested in today is the making, the art, the production, but also the conversations, the questions, the problems. And that brings us to where we are today. So thank you for inviting me. And I know there are questions. So what questions do you have?
Bravo. Thank you so uh, much, Kumasi. That was course. wonderful. Uh, Courtney Hunt and I are going to be moderating the q and I just want to remind everyone that you can um, put your questions for Kumasi into the q and uh, Click on the icon at the bottom of your screen and uh, pop your questions in there. But we'll start out with uh, some of our own to begin with. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for being here, Kamasi, and sharing your experience with us. I think it's um, really important for folks to hear the journey. You know, so much of when we get artist talks is about the work, and we want to talk to you about the work. But I think it's also really important to hear how you got to where you are now and um, the process that you went through. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you um, about this move from abstraction. Um, you mentioned that you were working in abstraction and then you moved into altered comics and it almost seems like it was an emotional and necessary move for you. Um, like your previous practice just wasn't working for what you wanted to get across. Um, do you feel like the alterations you make in these comic book covers connect at all to the emotional potential and abstraction? Um, and do you have advice for artists um, who may want to or find themselves shifting pretty radically in their practice and their end product? And by product, I mean work, sorry. <laughs> Don't mean to commercialize art here. No, um, we're American, everything is commercial. Um, I think, uh, the emotional uh, aspect of abstraction is a different sort of emotion. For me, it's always been more of a sort of like a cloud, a feeling, but not a very precise um, narrative. So like it's, it's like reducing it down to the point where everyone can feel it and understand it in some manner, but we don't know exactly what that is. This is more of a telling of stories for me and individual stories that are infinite in themselves, but together those infinities like form a different narrative. So one by itself has a story and, and the other ones have multiple stories all told at the same time. I always say this to students and artists, like to cut yourself a break because Art history looks like one thing is happening at, the, at a time, but it's never happening just alone by itself in a vacuum. So in the same studio, three or four different things may be happening at the same time. And you, you as an artist have to allow for that because you're so close to it. Sometimes you can't understand which is important until you're a little bit outside of it. Yeah, thank you. Of course. So as the as the comics uh, li librarian person here, I have to ask a, a comics related question. I'd love to just uh, take it way back to the beginning and hear from you about your uh, early experiences with comics. I know you mentioned that you uh, learned to read reading comics, which is a, mm. a wonderful thing. And I'd love to hear about, um, you know, what what kind of comics you were into, you know, your early exposure to them. And did you ever uh, consider becoming a cartoonist? Um, I never considered becoming car a cartoonist because everything I draw has like this, this different look to it. So like friends would say I could make a, a happy face smile. So uh, a happy face smile, sad for some reason. So, um, but there was this little library in Turner Station, which actually closed down when we were in like middle or high school, where they had this just a like, chest full of comic books. And they were just thrown in there. And me and my brother would go there every day during the summer and we'd just sit there and read the whole day, partially because it was air conditioned, but also because it had these comic books. And that summer, we both went from whatever reading level to um, ahead of the reading level. Are you frozen? I think you may be frozen, Kumasi. Yeah, I think we'll just wait a second to see if things catch up here. I think Kumasi has fallen out a little bit. 
There oh. you are. <laughs> Sorry. We lost you at um, reading level. The reading level, yeah. Yeah, so I, we went ahead of the reading level that summer and um, I read everything during that summer, but I can honestly say like Spider-Man, X-Men, those were my favorite, Green Lantern, but uh, read every comic that they had. And it was to the point where when we had jobs, we were spending like $150 a week a piece, me and my brother just building that collection. And then of course, you know, my mom gave it away to kids in the neighborhood when we were in college. Yeah, so um, our next question, my next question is a library nerd question because I'm the art and design librarian. <laughs> um, and I've been researching artists and research practice um, for the past year, it's an ongoing project. Um, and I'm gonna, I wanna ask you um, how you start an idea and what does information gathering mean to you? Um, and then also just sort of tying into that, how does your research practice differ now from when your practice was more in abstraction or does it? Uh, the research practice doesn't differ as much because it's a series of gathering ideas. Um, like I probably keep post-its in business because I write down an idea on a post-it and they live on the walls and then I combine them. So like I have a cheat sheet, like I have an idea on a post-it and then I expand upon it with a little framework, like a, a skeleton. And then I expand upon that to what it actually means. And then I trust myself that when I'm painting the thing, it is coming across. Um, there's a bit of like the library lives in every painting and it comes out of the library, but I was art history. So like when you say research, like it's not like, a, um, it's not like a YouTube video or a podcast. Like I was trained in original sources so I will go four levels deep to get to the original source material. I love that. Yeah, I, I nobody wants to hear about that. Oh, well, I do, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite things to do. So when you made this um, shift to um, altering comics, was there one comic book in particular that you reached for or, and how do you, how do you select them and why? Um, the first one was Spider-Man because Spider-Man has this thing where he doesn't win a lot. He just basically survives until the next fight and he isn't getting rich and it doesn't have the same veiled um, attempts at um, depict, depicting real social situations like X-Men does. So that was number one. And then it was a working through of the comics that I liked the most. And now it's just, it's really fun to, to see that in a new title and to get to be able to re-experience uh, going to comic book stores again, uh, digging through, well, it was before, before everything happened, digging through and finding things that either I had or I always wanted to buy and can get as an adult. I mean, I don't, I don't really read the old comics anymore because they don't stand up to what I remember, but I still love them. I have a follow-up question to that. Yeah. Too, and it actually relates to something I saw somebody put in the Q and A already. Um, when you're doing this, like, are you thinking of the comics as a platform for the message or is, is it in some, to some degree, a criticism of those comic books and the stories that are told with them? It's both. Like, uh, it's a criticism specifically of the time that these comics were written and of the people who still want them to remain that. Even in contemporary comics, they want those same stories told over and over again with the same people in the same situations, uh, with the same skin tones. Uh, and for some reason, they can't move past that to like adulthood. And being that, it makes a really interesting vehicle to tell real stories. 
because like um, 1930s uh, Donald Duck is a really interesting thing to look at. And Superman and Batman, like those stories are not what you think they were when you read them now. Like, yeah, don't get me into Batman because like he's got all the money in the world and he dresses up in a suit and beats people up. Like, Um, I have a question about the physicality of the comic book covers after they've been altered and your installation in the gallery space. Um, I noticed that they're, you keep them in the plastic sleeves and they're hung on the wall. And I'm wondering um, how this, do you think, um, affects the, the viewer and the experience of them? Um, or removes them from like the comic uh, store setting um, and their original purpose. Well, I wanted to invoke that, like that nostalgia and that memory, but leave people like one step removed from it. Like, so uh, it's also the feeling of if you're in a comic book store, there are some comics that you can't touch, some that are behind the counter. And these are the really valuable ones. So I want someone to feel that. There's also, um, because they're the size of the comics, when you walk into a gallery, you don't immediately know what the narrative is and you don't know what is inside of them. You just say, oh, comics from here. And then once you get inside of it, you're like, oh. So I want people to have that same feeling that they have in a comic book um, store, but to play off of that, to change their interactions with the work and have them think about what they really think about those comic books. Yeah, and, the, and just a follow-up um, kind of thought, I think that's really interesting to this, that you mentioned that there, even in a comic book store, there are ones that you can't touch. Um, it's sort of like in a record store too, when there's like the $200 yeah. record sitting there. Um, and then within the gallery space, there's already this sense that you can't, you shouldn't touch the art. So I, I love that um, th there are multiple meanings there just in the install. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Kaylin, do you wanna ask another question that we can move to audience question? Yeah, I think uh, we should talk a little bit about teaching. And I, I, it was really lovely to hear you talk about Fioris West, uh, late great, wonderful man who had such a major influence on a lot of painters that I know here in Columbus and even cartoonists like like Paul Pope who studied with him uh, when he was in school at OSU. Uh, we have a lot of students on the call uh, today or the video <laughs> webinar <laughs> um, and I'd love to hear you talk about um, how to phrase this just like what's what young people and students should look for in a mentor. I think mentoring is so important and um, just to hear you talk about that a little bit. Well, it's, um, it's hard, right? Um, I would say that um, you should understand that most of us as teachers will try to turn you into us because that's what we know and that's what we're good at. So you should take all of our opinions with a grain of salt. But if you find someone who's doing what you like and what you like to do, you should ask them as many questions as possible. Um, the beautiful thing, well, there's so many beautiful things about Fioris, but every time we had a, a meeting, I had to go get him. But he was always right across the hallway, like my studio and his studio, the doors like looked at each other. And he knew more about painting than anybody I had ever known, but he also knew more about what I was doing that I hadn't told anybody else. And when you experience that, when you find someone you think is, is smart or capable or giving, just like latch onto them and ask them questions. Um, most of us as adults don't get enough or any chance to talk about ourselves. So if you ask someone who you think uh, is in the position that you would wanna be about their journey to get there, you will get more information than you ever ever could ask for 
because if you um, if you want help, you ask for advice, and if you want advice, you ask for help. I just like with my students, I don't really like. I only want to give them agency because they're already talented enough to do what they want to do. Um, they just they're so young that they can't imagine it. And they think that there needs to be someone who says, OK, you can do it now because you've got this paper or you've done these years. I love that man so much, though. Um, um, I, I actually had another teaching question, too. Um, I'm interested in whether or not teaching affects your practice. Um, so you sort of talked about the ability of a mentor to um, share and build with you. Um, how do you see yourself in that role now um, as you're teaching students and how it perhaps affects your own work? Well, it affects my communication, most of all. Um, I think it's, it's, it's better now that I'm not doing abstraction because there's a a temptation to like take things that the students are doing really well that they just throw to the side. Um, but like, I've made a switch from um, really teaching what I thought people needed and what like made me feel like a teacher to really making people better at what they want to do. So I don't know that I'm a great teacher. One day. I feel like, like if you if you knew you were a great teacher, then you wouldn't be a great teacher. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like you always yeah. need to be evolving, right? So um and learning. I, I think it makes good teachers are the ones that never think that they're great. <laughs> Well, I think like I think some of the things that I'm teaching now won't become like useful until two or three years from now. And and I don't get to see that. So I like it's made my work habits much more diligent. Well, we have a lot of questions coming in, so I think we'll uh, mix in some of ours with some from the from the Q&A. Uh, Suzanne Silver, who's a professor in the art department at OSU, asks, is it essential that you uh, that you alter a found comic or could you envision your own starting from scratch? So creating your own comic series even. Yeah, I mean, for this work, um, it's, it's essential that I use the found comics. It's, it's uh, a part of it is that narrative that's already been established and that pop culture and that, um, like uh, it's not supposed to be uh, my culture because I'm black. Like it's supposed to be like an American thing, but it is mine. So that's important. Um, doing my own, own comics, like I do, but like uh, I don't think anyone will see them for a long time because what they are um, clashes with being able to see this at the same time. That's very interesting. I would love to see them. <laughs> Not for a while. That's years. Um, so another uh, son has asks um, about gender in your comics um, or in your work uh, in the paintings. Um, and the fact that many of the covers that you showed us today um, were of characters that presumably identify as men. Um, our men are fairly masculine in their presentation. Um, do you think about gender when you make these works? Does that um, does that come across at all? Like, is there um, are there issues of masculinity that are coming up for you as you as you work through them? Well, definitely, um, because there is this uh, sort of false ideal man that most of these comics are in, like this sort of uh, WWE wrestling, The Rock type of hardcore dude. Um, one of the things that I'm very, very careful of and very um, aware is that representing um, 
gender from my perspective is very, very different than other people's perspectives. So as a cis male, it's like, uh, I did a, a series that's like they, them. And uh, there's, this, there's this thing that uh, we have one idea of what uh, gay, straight, uh, uh, transgender, um, gender fluid is. Like for every one of those words, we have this one image in our mind. And breaking that is part of what that series is. But I don't, even with um, family members who are gay, I don't know enough to represent enough. And, and the learning of uh, where my biases is and what I want to represent isn't something that I, I need to grab from someone else. It's something that I constantly do work on. So, you know, I start from my perspective because that's what I know. Great. Megan Real asks, what current comics inspire you? Um, current? There's this, um, like, Valiant is doing some interesting things with some of their comics. Uh, there's this also like Faith and some of the other ones are interesting. Uh, the Manhattan Projects is interesting from Image. Uh, there's this series from, um, I can't remember the, the publisher, maybe Black Mask and it's called Black. It's if only black people got superpowers. And that is an incredible series. Uh, I reading a lot of manga and manhwa and Chinese um, like comics, like I probably too much. So, and I'm really interested in some of the new superheroes that are out in Marvel and DC, like some of the new ones. If I had been eight or 12, that would have been so great. That's awesome. Um, so now we have a question from Gina Osterlo from the Department of Art. Um, who says, hi, Kumasi, thank you for your concise rewriting of the American narrative um, for offering a truthful narrative. I, I'm struck by the powerful potential for the medium of comics to cut through class and socioeconomic barriers and to circulate through multiple spheres, not just galleries, not just museums. Um, would you say yes, and this is related, I think, to Suzanne's question too. Would you say yes if someone asked you to direct a new comic series maybe not create, but direct a new comic series based on the characters you have developed on the cover, um, would you consider platforms other than galleries and museums? The short answer is yes. Um, I wouldn't do it from the series of uh, comics that I'm doing here, but it would be a completely different uh, story with completely different characters. Uh, and yeah, I would always love to do that and yeah and that would be interesting but I also like it would take some time and it would be a really weird read because what I write is a really interesting read I would put it that way right. yeah that's an interesting question and thanks for that and thank you Suzanne hi Suzanne oh that was from Gina but Suzanne had asked about um oh yeah her. thank you Gina <laughs> Um, so what has it been like for you to be uh, creating work during COVID? I'd love to, to hear about that experience. I know for some cartoonists that I know, they feel like life is no different than it ever was before. And it's just that the rest of the world is now getting to live the cartoonist lifestyle of, of isolation. And I imagine painting might, might be similar, but I'd love to hear about your experience and uh, any advice that you have for other artists that are enduring this. Well, it's been wonderful to have all of this uh, time and like just to work. And it's been terrible because I don't have a, like a studio right now. So I'm like working and living in the same apartment, which is very detrimental for me. You have to know like what kind of artist you are. And I'm an artist who doesn't, uh, should not have access to his couch 
and his refrigerator. He should have access to his studio. And so like that's been terrible, but I mean, I'm starting to really welcome being out amongst people without actually talking to them. Like that was one of the beautiful things about New York. It's being um, alone in a crowd of people. And I do miss that. But yeah, I've got a lot accomplished. Yeah, it's it's been an interesting time. Um, so uh, Duke Sarah asks um, or makes a comment about um, being a librarian and uh, their heart twinging at the altered covers until they realize these are mass produced items and um, you're making unique uh, items out of them and giving entirely new meaning. Um, I, and I actually think that you mentioned this in your presentation for a moment, you felt hesitant, like, oh, I'm taking this thing I love, and I'm creating something new out of it. Um, can you talk about that, about like the dichotomy there between mass production and one of a kind items that are being shown on a gallery wall um, and just that, yeah, just that. But, yeah, I mean, I understand the, the pain because I felt that when I first went to them, but I also like, I looked at them and I'm like, what am I keeping them for? They're not doing anything. They just sit in this closet. They serve no other purpose, but to have me feel like I own them. Uh, so I came to that pretty quick afterwards. It like the initial pain was real and I hurt doing it, but like there's this interesting thing with America or capitalism. I, it's like the idea of supply and demand when it's not supply and demand here, like it's demand and demand because we have supply. It doesn't matter what you want, we can get it for you. And like, it doesn't matter what comic you want, I can get it for you. How much do you want to pay? And how much is it in demand? So we've actually gone from, uh, 10 to 50 to 150 to a million comics to one. And I like that dichotomy. And I like that it hurts a little bit because it should. Thank you. It's personal. There's a, what I think is a very lovely question that was submitted uh, before the event when people were registering, which mm -hmm. is um, what is an emotional memory that you have about comics? Ooh. Um, so there are multiple. There's an issue of the Sandman where uh, it's a retelling of the Sandman uh, written by Neil Gaiman, who's in love with a woman. And it was an old story retold and it's this beautiful piece. And he goes to save her from hell and, or he goes and he meets her in hell and lets her go. But it's like, it's that, and it's also a black woman. And it's just like, he transforms from different angles to different people. And I love that. But it's also me, my brother, and our best friends riding bikes to the comic book store when we're like 12. And absolutely not telling our parents we're going 45 minutes out of the way to get these comics and learning exactly how much tax is and learning that math through buying comic books. I love that so much, that was wonderful. I love that too. <laughs> uh, I, just the, the, the childhood memory of doing anything that was outside of you know, your parents' view and- Yeah, because if, if you don't tell them, they're- They're fine. <laughs> what they don't know won't hurt them. <laughs> Um, so there's a question from Laura Lisbon um, who says, so great to hear you Kamasi and see your new work. Thank you. I think about your powerful use of the dynamic painted gesture in the work you made in grad school and wonder if you see an equivalent in the work you are making now. Well, first off, hi, Laura. Just like, hi, Suzanne. Um, there isn't so much the gesture, but there is a painterly element that is not um, immediately identifiable through um, uh, photographs and scans of the work. 
because you can, when you get close to them, you can see the painted elements and you can see the touches of the hand, which is another way to have that real uh, painterly aspect and interaction with the work. And that's, um, it's really fun to do. And it's really interesting to hold yourself back once you're at the point where you know you can paint anything, but you can't get obsessive. So, yeah, I love Ohio State. Like, I really, like, I knew when I went to Ohio State that I was going to go to New York afterwards. And it really hurt me to leave. Well, it's clear that Ohio State loves you. It's great to see so many professors on here and, and students. Um, there's a question, uh, again, that was submitted in advance by a registrant about how specifically your education helped to build your career. And I think if you can speak to that, but also maybe a little bit about the immediate postgraduate life uh, is something that a lot of students have a lot of you know, anxiety about and um, just uncertainty uh, on. So I'd love to hear you talk about it. Oh, yeah. Um, so it depends on what you want to do. So if you want to teach, there are different ways to go about it. Um, I didn't want to teach. That wasn't my thing. Uh, I knew I wanted to go to New York. So the last ooh, two semesters or so, I spent my time preparing for that. And um, I, I spent the time like learning how to really live on a budget. One of the like the top three things you can do to become an artist and stay an artist for a long period of time is learn how to do a budget, personal and for an artistic uh, project. Because if you can learn how to do a $0 budget where everything is equal at the end and you can stick to it, you can probably survive. It's also while I was in school, I always knew I was an artist who was in school, not a student was an artist and uh, thinking about things that way also was really, really important. I went to New York because I knew I wanted to go to New York and I knew uh, people in New York. Um, but I would also say like, there's a lot of world and it's not the same as when I graduated. You can do whatever you wanna do from anywhere right now. And this like pandemic is proving that like uh, you can go to Sacramento if you know people in Sacramento or Arizona if you are from Arizona, but you, you have to remember like who you are and why you're doing it. Yeah, um, I, the idea of the post-grad experience and um, you know, the translation from like your graduate school practice into the real world and what you might actually end up making and what your voice is, is really, yeah, I think, I don't, important. I don't yeah. think you're making just as long as you continue to make. Yeah. Uh, and actually, if you take a break, that's probably what you need to do for a while is take a break. Um, so like, yeah, it's interesting, but don't, don't expect it to happen right away. Like give yourself room. Yeah, that, that reminds me of um, a professor of mine from graduate school at Hunter who said um, her biggest piece of advice to um, art history grads was to keep reading. <laughs> so like this idea of keep making, um, keep reading. I was wondering, um, I'm we're gonna do like, I'm going to do one more short question, then Caitlin's going to do another question, and then um, we'll wrap up. But um, I, I would love to know, um, how have people responded to these covers? Um, have you gotten direct feedback from um, gallery goers? Yeah, well, it, I've gotten good feedback from a lot of people, but it's also uh, people don't tell you they don't like something. Uh, it's really hard to do. Uh, but also, one of my favorite things is to have people ask very, very difficult questions of uh, the curators. So to have uh, like people who are my friends who are these white curators try to explain this heavy, heavy work, especially to Black people, 
is, is very, very interesting. So it's an interesting dynamic inside of the gallery. I try not to, to be in the middle of it because people want to talk less when I'm in the middle of it, even though I really do want to talk about it. Ah, oh, that's so interesting. I hadn't even thought about that. Like just what a white space the gallery world is. And I mean, I, I think about that a lot, but in terms of the work and how people might interact with the curators. Yeah, thank you. So I'm gonna ask the last question and it's a little bit uh, selfish of me, but, um, but it's something entirely different. So our time at OSU, mine and yours did not overlap. And I uh, was familiar with you before I knew about your OSU connection because of your TikTok presence which is uh, pretty outstanding. You have amazing uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of followers. And what you post on there, uh, I, you often share your work, but you also post a lot of these like uh, meditations on life and, and positive affirmations and stuff. And they're, they're really lovely. And um, I would love to hear you talk about that. And if the, you, know, you view like positivity as a form of activism or, how that relates, if at all, to, to what you put out in the world uh, through your art. Uh, wow. Well, first, I don't think it's like positive, but that's so nice. <laughs> like, that's embarrassing. Um, it's, I don't think of myself as a, a positive person. Like, I'm sort of neutral, if not um, very negative slash um, uh, realistic. And I think that there are a lot of people who get this constant bombardment of, you're sad, just be happy. Like life isn't really like that. Like some people aren't just happy. Like I'm not just happy. If I'm happy, people around me get scared. But if I'm just kind of, eh, people are good. And I think of it when I do it, I think of things that I would like to, to say to my daughter that she would probably never listen to me. Like, I don't think kids really listen to their parents when they try to teach them life lessons most of the time. They'll remember them years later when they move out. But if for some reason I'm gone or if for some reason like she wanted to know what I think, it's there. And if I approach it from that perspective, that's it. That's wonderful. Like that I guess I, I shouldn't have said positive, but maybe like well, no, no, no. life affirming or like there's just something very comforting about what you post. They're reassuring. Comforting, yeah, I think it's comforting. Yeah, comforting is like the thing. I love that. Well, I um, we're going to invite Allison back on here to do a little wrap up, but I just want to say thank you so much. Yeah, thank really you. So, this thank has you been really me. just great. So thanks so much, Kumasi, for coming. And also, what is your TikTok name so we can share it? <laughs> Uh, it's the Kumasi. It's the Kumasi at everything. Yeah, so thank you, the Kumasi. It's a wonderful, the whole, to be honest, the, the, the birth of this Creative Pathfinders event was really imagined around having you back, Kumasi, and, and this conversation with these wonderful interviews. Thank you, Courtney and Caitlin, for your time and energy today. I would like everyone to please join us for the final Creative Pathfinders event, which is happening uh, with the Barnett Center uh, and the Department of Dance. It's next Wednesday, March 10th at 12.30 p.m. And so we really look forward to welcoming you back. And thanks again so much for everyone and for your energy and all the great questions from our audience. Have a great day. <laughs>